This is ODAT Chat, your instant connection to recovery and community, one day at a time. This podcast may contain strong language, sexual content, and spiritual truth. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to ODAT Chat. My name is Arlena, and I'll be your host. If you're new here, this is a podcast where my guest and I talk about how to recover from alcoholism and addiction. We largely focus on unpacking the issues that cause addiction and how it affects us, but also on the solutions that contribute to long-term recovery. The goal of the podcast is to help people suffering from drug and alcohol addiction, and we are reaching people in 33 countries now, so that's pretty cool. I actually get email regularly from people who have shared how guests have touched their lives with their courageous and honest stories of how they have overcome their addictions, and these stories help them feel connected and give them hope for recovery, so that is super awesome. Thank you to everyone who's been on the podcast. ODAT chat is funded by members like you, so if you would like to help keep the podcast going, please consider a $5 monthly membership. To join, just visit odatchat.com. So today my guest is the super fabulous and charming Eric Sims. He shares his story of growing up in the Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas area, or as they say, the DFW. He talks about his troubled youth, drug smuggling escapades, three DUIs, his own family struggles, and just when all hope was lost, how he was finally able to hear the message of recovery. Eric has since dedicated his life to helping others through several organizations, demonstrating that there is always hope for recovery. So without further ado, please enjoy this episode with Eric. Eric, thanks so much for joining me on the Oda Chat podcast today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, so what I typically do is I give the listeners a little bit of a description of what you look like, how old you are in your profession. So, Sure. I'm uh, 44 years old, and um, I, I professionally I, I do a, a two different things. So I'm, a, I'm involved in the BPO space or contact center space as in operations, and then I also do um, professional and life coaching as well. Awesome. How long have you been doing that? The, the BPO stuff I've been doing for about the last 10 years. The life coaching has been something I really just picked up in the last, I'd say, year and a half. I've spent a lot of time coaching in some different aspects over the last 10 years, but this migration over to what I'm doing now just started about a year, a year and a half ago. Very cool. And where did you grow up originally? I grew up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, actually in Fort Worth, Texas. So I'm a native Texan. Native Texan. I thought I detected a little accent. (laughs) It'll it'll slow down a little bit here and there, and I might say a word that doesn't even mean anything, or (laughs) we have a tendency to make up words sometimes. No, I love that. That's hilarious. Very good. So your family of origin, do you have siblings or? Yeah, I I have one younger brother. He's about two and a half years younger than me. And then that was it. It was just us. It's just he and I. Okay. For siblings. Yeah, and tell me a little bit about your parents. Your parents uh, raised you in the in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Is that where they were from as well? Yes, both of them were born and raised there. Uh, it, one thing about the DFW area is there's very few people leave. Um, <laughs> so uh, the population continues to grow with people moving there, but also there's very few people that exit. That's interesting. Why Why do you think that is? I like to say it's a good place to live. I mean, it's it's, it's a uh, you know, the economy is always good there. There's a lot of growth and potential there. And then it's always been kind of a big city, but a small city feel, you know, so people know each other and they just, you know, and there's no reason to go anywhere, I guess. You know, I mean, a lot of people move off and even come back. I'm, I'm one of the few that's still gone. And you, you did move. You mentioned to me earlier, you, you moved to Tampa, Florida. Is that right? Yeah, I moved to Tampa, Florida back in 2006. So I came out here to get some uh, sunshine. To get some sunshine. Yeah. Well, that is the place to do it. So tell me a little bit about, since we're doing a recovery podcast, I'm always interested to hear about people's childhood and family and, and kind of how mm-hmm. you grew up. Yeah. Um, my childhood was really, like people used to call us the Beaver Cleaver family. Like we were, <laughs> you know, it was like Warden June. Like, you know, we had dinner at six every night and mom and dad were both around. It was a very loving household. 
uh, very. I grew up in a Christian home, so there was mm -hmm. there was a lot of religion. Well, you were in Dallas, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. If you look around, there's like a church per person. I think there now, so everybody has their own. I think. <laughs> church but, per person. Um, yeah, it's uh, but yeah, the church environment, obviously. And so I went to, you know, I went to a, a private Christian school um, for elementary school and for middle school. So I had between that and church on Sundays. It was quite a bit of, of, of church and God and religion in my life uh, at an early age. Uh, I'm familiar. I actually grew up a uh, Southern Baptist, so that was... <laughs> there you go. So you, so I, you, I you know my pain. I do. Yeah. I understand. You have, you have felt my, my pain at times. So, <laughs> and I don't want to make it sound too bad. I, I have a lot of great memories from that. I have, sure. I have a lot of hurtful memories from the same stuff too. So it's kind of a combination of stuff. But right. um, I think my experience with a lot of that early on turned me off to quite a bit of it for a long time mm -hmm. growing up. But, um, you know, my childhood was, you know, we pl I played sports. There was, I, looking back, and, and now that I'm a little bit older and I have my own kids, I, I realize like how much, how many great things we had growing up that I just took for granted. Like I didn't realize how awesome, you know, that, you know, living in the, big house that we lived in and having the huge Christmases that we had, you know, at the time I was a spoiled brat and I just thought it was the way everybody lived. Mm -hmm. um, you know, looking back now, I'm like, man, my parents really did a great job with a lot of that stuff. And so, um, you know, it was, it was a, a, you know, very on the, on the outside, we looked really great. And on the inside, we were pretty good, you know? Mm -hmm. um, That's not bad. No, no, it wasn't bad. You know, I, I uh, you know, like I said, I, I, a lot of times I'm telling my story, people are like, well, what's, what the hell happened? <laughs> and, you know, and, um, but, you know, when I look back and I, in, in my recovery, I've done, you know, quite a bit of evaluating. Um, I can remember, though, being as early as preschool, like, you know, four years old. Mm -hmm. I uh, have a vivid memory of my first day of preschool walking in. And, and when I walked in, I remember stepping behind my mom's, like, leg, you know, and feeling like everybody hates me. Oh, interesting. You know, yeah, it was a real weird separation, like just, and, and that was kind of the underlying theme for me that was like this, like, you know, nobody gets me or nobody likes me or whatever it may be that felt me, that, that was kind of an, that fear, you know, was, I remember that early on. Hmm. So. Is that one of your earliest, one of your earliest memories? Yeah, that's one. I mean, I have some other little kid memories, like, you know, falling off my little horsey in the room, and knocking my tooth out. But, you know, oh my goodness. that was, I think I was three or four, you know, like, just because it hurt. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so I kind of remember that. But, um, and, and a lot of good memories of, you know, Christmases and, you know, family being around and playing with my brother and stuff like that. But that memory, you know, from a, from a, um, something that's uncomfortable, you know, that was like the first real, like, I just remember feeling like, whoa, you know, like, and I think I can still see it. Yeah. Was that like just self-consciousness? And it's interesting that you went to the negative place with it, that they, you know, I've heard people say that um, they didn't feel a part of or like yeah. they belonged, but it's interesting that you're, you know, it, you know, you felt an extreme like dislike from people. Like you use the word hate. That's a pretty strong word. Yeah, it, it was, it, I, I've articulated it at times in a way, it's like, I felt like, you know, as an adult, I would articulate it this way, but the way I would describe it is like, everybody got there, and they had a meeting before I showed up, and had decided they weren't going to like me. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's how I felt. You okay. Know? I was like, it was one of those weird deals, like, I just it immediately felt like that, and then, you know, just felt that separation from, right. from everybody. Right. Oh, what a terrible feeling. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a... Uh, Kind of weird. And how did your how did your mother respond to that? Did I don't think she knew. She probably thought I was just being shy, you know, and just um, hiding behind her legs. So mm -hmm. you know, because I was a little kid, and probably much like I do with my kids, hiding. Like, hey, it's okay. Come on out, you know. And, sure. Um, so you know, she she did fine. And put me in the class, and you know, off it she was a uh, off she went. Yeah, yeah. Was, it's cool. Okay. Okay. And um, and what did your father do professionally? He uh, he did a couple things, but at that point in time, he was in the jewelry business, and then later in life, he w he went into uh, real estate. Okay, was your mom a stay at home mom? She stayed at home until we were you know in, in school full time, mm -hmm. and then she she was a teacher, so her schedule kind of matched our schedule, so that she could oh, be perfect. home when when we were home and make sure we were picked up from school and all that kind of stuff where my wow. dad did. You guys really were like the, uh, <laughs> the beaver. No, family. <laughs> it, it was, I mean, we're, our house was the one that everybody came to, you know, cause it was like, your house always has dinner ready. And 
you know, you guys have all the cool stuff. And so it it really was a a great upbringing. You know, there was no, there was nothing, you know, there was nothing, uh, nothing I would call abnormal or not, not stellar, you know? So what the hell happened? (laughs) Yeah, it was, when I go back and look, it's like that, that was the position I felt in life all through childhood was like, there was like, a separation uh, for me, okay. and then I needed to do things to to make people like me, right. or to g- get attachment. And so I started developing this kind of personality. You know, and I found out real quick that the way I could control how people felt about me was kind of being the bad kid. Oh, really? Okay. So you started acting out almost from the beginning in school. Yeah, I mean, preschool I didn't, but at, by the time I, I got in elementary school, I think by the time I was like second grade, I really started acting out some more. And then, you know, by the time I hit like, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, I was, I was doing some, nothing, I wasn't robbing banks or anything, but you know, for a kid, you know, for kids, I would push the limits to get attention, to try to get people to um, like me. And most of the time, the way I would do that was going to the extreme of doing something that was, you know, not supposed to be done, you know, right. like whatever it may be, like, you know, get out of line or whatever it was at that age, right. you know, leave the playground, you know, I think in sixth grade, my thing was sneak off the playground, run down the street to 7-Eleven, get a box of, of blow pops and bring it back and sell it on the playground because the kids thought it was cool. Oh, my goodness. Um, you left campus. Yeah. That's really, that's kind yeah. of ballsy, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It was a... Uh, very entrepreneurial. It's, like, now, it's like, that's very entrepreneurial. I had that yeah. sales side. I was like, hey, man, I can make some money here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but it was, that was kind of the model. Right? I just would figure out things to do that got people to look at me in a way that would, you know, I could control and, right. you know, maybe they thought I was cool or I don't know, whatever, you know, whatever that was, whatever that was, at least I thought that's what they were thinking. Right. Right. It's hard yeah, to but it, 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 like anything else, it would escalate. The older I got, I kept having to do more and more and more, you know, of those things and to get the same result. Right. And, uh, when, when did you actually start using? So I had my first drink when I was 12. Um, and I had my first joint when i was i think I, I mean, that was joint when i was 12 too about the same time i was about 12 years old okay i ran around with a bunch of older kids during high school because i wanted to be cool of course so yeah because i wanted to fit in and then if i ran with the older kids and the younger kids would think i was cool so here again there's that game i'd play right right and uh but then i'd, co- I'd compromise a lot to get acceptance from people who you know were in those positions so you know i was scared to death but i did it and then um, it, it was a very similar story here in the rooms, you know, like first time I did it, I felt I immediately felt, um, at ease, you know, and, and, and like, okay. For the first time, like, it was mm-hmm. just that, you know, like, I was like, Hey, this is not, this is great. I, I could be, be quote, be myself or whatever, you know? Right. And so, um, you know, it was that, and then, you know, smoke cigarettes and so like, anything that was pushing the limits that was not what I'm supposed to be doing always made me feel better. Yeah, this kind of stuff is exciting. You know, I I did all that kind of stuff too. Um, but it, you know what was interesting? I just picked up picked up on something that you said um, when you were hanging out with the older kids that you compromised yourself. And um, mm-hmm. you know, I feel like that's sort of a reoccurring theme with a lot of people, right? We sell ourselves out for approval or um, to be a part of. Does anything stand out in your mind, um, like what you had to do to sell out to be a part of? No, I, well, I mean, it was. Just, I think the, the memories that I have are always of um, me being super scared to do it, mm. you know, and knowing that it wasn't the good thing to do or the right thing for me to do, and knowing that I knew better, but at the same time, having this weird mixed emotion of like, well, what are they going to think of me now if I don't? Right. And like this enormous amount of what you know, self pressure, peer pressure, or whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. to to do that. And then you know, when I was done, then it was you know, and, and I, I would feel shame because I knew that I didn't wasn't supposed to do that. Right. So it was like that kind of cycle, right? Of hey, right. I know better than this, but I don't know what else to do. And then it just perpetuated into other stuff. Right. No, I get it. You no, know, we did things like, you know, like maybe fighting or. Or taking things, yep. shoplifting. Um, yep. that, was, that was a big one in high school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it was anything. I did all those things too. It was in, anything that was like a 
a push away from what everybody was supposed to do, right? right. Like, so, hey, hey, you know, what if somebody goes steals a, a, a Playboy magazine when we were younger? You know, like, I'll do it. I'll sneak out and run down to 7-Eleven and steal the Playboy magazine and steal some cigarettes. Mm-hmm. Hey, I'll go down and steal a six-pack of beer because we can't buy it, you know? Right. So it was like, you know, any, anything that put me in that light of, like, hey, he's the go-to guy. Get him to do it. He's crazy enough to do anything, you know? Yeah. Um, you know that that was my that was that started to become my you know persona yeah. like that was kind of and I liked it because I got right. the attention mm-hmm. and I got the connection I was looking for you know right and I could control it to a certain extent yeah absolutely you know it's amazing that um I remember growing up and, and doing things like that we used to have uh do you, do you guys have golf land where you are it's like a mini golf thing we have putt 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 golf <laughs> yeah yeah we have putt putt golf yeah, so us kids would go down to like where the mini golf is, and but right across the street was like this golf course, and so the kids would go run across this really busy street, and um, somebody would have shoulder tapped, and so we'd get some booze, uh, and this is like in junior high, and uh, yeah, we would go over to the golf course and hide behind this wall and get hammered. And, and <laughs> run across this busy street back to where the golf was. And yeah. it's just crazy. I remember one girl falling down in the middle of the street and having to, like, pick her up and drag her across the street before she got hit by a car. I mean, it was crazy. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, the stories are endless, right? <laughs> yeah, really. Oh, just, Seriously. Yeah. yeah. No, that's wild. I, I am sometimes shocked that uh, we survive our childhoods. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm blown away at times. So did your brother um, participate in drinking and using as well? No, he kind of took another path with all that because he saw you know, how I was acting. And, and how I would act caused, caused a lot of conflict at home oh. because it was like, hey, that's not how we act. Like, you know, we don't do that kind of stuff, right? My mom had never smoked a cigarette and didn't drink. We didn't drink, they didn't drink in my house. They were very religious. And, yeah, they were. Well, my dad just didn't drink. I, I never... He just didn't. He's, mm-hmm. He never really addressed it and said he, and, and said why. Um, my mom didn't drink because he didn't drink and because they didn't want to drink around us. Mm-hmm. And uh, then she had been like, a, she was just one of those goody goody girls, like just never, you know, never had sex until she got married, never smoked a cigarette, never really drank until she was old enough. You know, like all this. She's just, oh, she Lord. was the perfect princess. <laughs> yeah. I know. I was like, how the she, she used to laugh. Like, how the hell did I have you? I was like, I don't know. How, how the hell are you, my mom? You I know, know right? But, what kind but, of karma um, is she trying to burn? I don't know. Yeah. So, <laughs> what did she it, do in her past life? Poor thing. I don't know. She was she was a good kid. She was like, I was just always so scared of my parents. I was, I didn't want to get in trouble. Oh, that's so interesting. Was she a first child? She was an only child. Oh, um, okay. She had a she had a stepbrother, uh, but for most of her childhood, she was the only child. He was older than her. So. Interesting. Um, yeah, so it was that that was part of it, I think. And and her, her parents had divorced. So I think she you know, attached herself to her mom and knew that she didn't mm-hmm. want to put additional stress on her mother and all that kind of stuff. So I think there was a lot of that in there. She well, listen, told me. if if your mom's parents divorced back in those days, that was not okay. Yeah, no. It was big big no no. Well, that was a big secret until, you know, I was old enough to figure that one out and they finally had to tell me like they hid that from us for a while. Isn't that interesting? That was the, that was the big family secret for a little oh, while. Oh, poor thing. Yes, <laughs> it was in well, I think it was just, you know, back again, I had a grand, my grandmother remarried, so I had a grandpa. Right. And I don't think at that age they were just like, they didn't want to try to have to figure out how to explain that to us. And so they just said, we'll wait till later. And yeah. uh, and then I figured it out. At some point in time, I found a Bible that had the different last name in it. I was like, hey, what's this all about? Yeah. Scandalous. And like, Damn, you figured that out. <laughs> the scandalous Bible gave it away. Yeah. The Bible. <laughs> I told you the Bible has the truth in it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh goodness! And listen, that's interesting that your your dad just didn't drink. There was no explanation, no like. No, I mean later on. So later on, my dad passed. Mm-hmm. Um, I I had found I found out from a friend of his who was like his best friend. Um, sat down and talked to me one day when I was you know really screwed up and said you know your dad didn't drink because he had some issues with drinking when he was younger and he he quit. Oh, and, um, your dad never but, told you. No, nobody ever shared that with me. And um, so I was like, well, that explains why he used to get so frustrated with me. He, he and I had a had a good relationship, but it was a little detached. Like I was always closer to my mother mm-hmm. and he 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 was 
I don't know if he was. I look at it now, and I don't know if he was. I told myself he was close to my brother. I don't know that he was. I think that he and I just didn't connect like I wanted to, mm-hmm. and so I told myself, "Well, he just likes my brother better." You know, that was, that was a bullshit story I made up. But, sure. um, you know, I, I I think his his struggle was he saw he saw probably a lot of himself in me. You know, right. and so didn't know how to articulate that. And then again, you know, I don't know. He was he was a very quiet guy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even when after he passed away, my mom said, there's a lot of stuff about your dad I just never knew, you know? Oh, and, um, he just didn't open up. Yeah, he wasn't very open. He's very quiet. My brother's that way. You know, he's, he doesn't talk a lot and uh, he talks to me, but that's about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> your brother talks to so, you and that's it? He talks, yeah, he and I are real tight and, um, but you know, that's, that he, you know, everybody else is at arm's length. Yeah. Right. Just that one person. And uh, how old was your father when he passed away? He was 50, it would have been like 52 or 53. It was in 94. He died. Oh, yeah. okay. Let's see. Your yeah, he, 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 committed, he, he committed suicide. Oh, he did at 54. Yeah. Do you think he was yep. suffering from depression or did he leave a note? Or He did leave a note. Um, it was, there was some depression. There was, there was a number of things. Like there was some major financial issues. Mm. Um, there were some issues with like his mom passed from cancer early mm-hmm. and he never he never dealt with it and so i think he carried for a, a good amount of years undealt with pain right sure. and then turned into some depression and then you couple that with some major financial struggles and then and then you triple that with the bill the fact that the guy didn't communicate to anybody so like he, he oh, didn't have an outlet shut down. yeah he shut down and i think he just broke you know, like by the time they wrote the mm-hmm. letter, like I remember reading the letter, I was like, this doesn't even sound like him. Like it was just, you know, like he, it just sounded like a guy who's just snapped, you know? Wow. So it was, it was, uh, that was, you know, that was, I, I'll never forget that. That was like the worst, the worst of the worst. You know, there's no, I can't equate anything that's ever happened to me. It's been that bad. How, how old and were so you at the time? I was, I was 21. My brother was a, almost, oh, my brother was like 21. a senior in high school. Oh, in yeah. high school. <clears throat> yeah. So. We had, luckily, when he passed, he and I had mended our relationship a little bit. Because <clears throat> through high school, I was a real asshole. I just mm-hmm. partied nonstop. I was in trouble all the time. I was, I was already drinking heavily, doing drugs all the time. Um, mm-hmm. So I was constantly in trouble, you know, getting, you know, ticketed for this or arrested for that, you know. Mm-hmm. And, um, and he'd come bail me out and we'd talk or whatever it was. And, you know, I promised I never was going to do it again. And, then, you know, next weekend I was out doing the same shit. Mm-hmm. But, um we kind of mended things up between us, but it was just, you know, all that hit and he didn't see any other way out. And so he felt like that was in that state. That was the only solution he could find. And so I'm so sorry. That is so tragic. Yeah. It spun us out. Like my brother still struggles. It spun me out pretty good because it took me from, you know, I would say at that point in time, I was a, my my mission with partying, even though I still did way too much of it and was already an alcoholic, mm-hmm. it was still on the fun side. Like I could look at it and go, I was still having a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, after that, it it changed greatly for me. You know, like it, the whole the whole thing changed because I got I got angry and um, didn't deal with it. You know, was ill equipped to deal with it. Right. Sure. And then refused to get any help to deal with it. And um, and so I, I self-medicated, you know, was the only thing I knew how to do because I'd already been doing it. Right. So I took, you know, then you take the, the part that I already struggled with, which was my self-identity of, you know, who am I? And mm-hmm. I've got this persona of the bad guy that I pretended to be. And then so now at 21, it was just like, hey, let's just crank that up. You know, t- right. let's take it from a two, a two to an eight or a ten and see what happens, because who gives a shit anyway? Was kind of my mentality. So. Wow. Um, it, 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 my twenties were pretty nuts, you know, like r- just insanely, you know, drug addiction really kicked in at a couple years later because what, uh, I, what kind of drugs were you using? So yeah, I'd always done some ecstasy and smoked weed and, you know, whatever was that, whatever was at the party, but you know, I, what I would consider. They're like those recreational drugs, but you know, back then they were called recreational drugs. What are they called at the time? <laughs> I know. It's not um, funny. But I was like, yeah, what isn't a recreation? Um, <laughs> Why um, else would you do it? At, at, yeah, at 24, I was in I was in the car business, and um, 
you know, my dad had left me a little bit of money, so I was using that to like buy and sell cars because I thought that's what I wanted to do with a buddy of mine. And um, had a guy approach us that we were doing some business with, and we ended up getting into smuggling. And so that was the first time I ever really did any like cocaine, which was ended up being my drug of choice. Mm-hmm. Um, was at 24, I I uh, had smuggled some cocaine across the country and got back to get paid and received my payment and also received a big uh bonus <laughs> like a, you know <laughs> a it was like an white ounce. Bonus. You know, he's like he throws me an ounce of cocaine and he's like hey man take this too for your time you know a big envelope of cash made a bunch of money i was like well this is great like all of a sudden like all right dude, i have I arrived that. yeah well it was it was like hang on this is this is the this is what i wanted to do i wanted to be the bad guy now i can really be the bad guy and i'll have yeah, money really to do were. all the stuff i wanted to do yeah I can control everything, which was, you know, I can fix my dad's inability to control his finances by just doing this and controlling all the finances and be the bag at the same time. Oh. And um, I, I'll, no, buddy of mine and I got, well, I was like, what the hell am I going to do this Coke? I don't do cocaine. That's why in my head, I'm like. So oh, I, you hadn't tried I, it yet? No, I had never tried it. Oh and my so God. I was like, I don't, do, I don't do Coke, you know? And so, you know, we had it at the house, got drunk, came home, tried it. And I was like, oh man, this is it. <laughs> This is, holy shit, why didn't I find this earlier? Yeah. You know? Where have they been hiding this? This is the rocket fuel I've been looking for. And, um, you know, for a couple of reasons. One, like, I got high off of it. But the other thing was, like, I could drink more. You know? I was like, so it's like a perfect world for me. Yeah. Um, And then I, and then off we went, you know? And and in and out in my 20s, I stayed in that business for quite a while. And there was a... The car business all, or the smuggling? No, the, the smuggling business. Oh and uh, goodness, the car business like, ended very quickly because who the hell wants to do that? When you why can would you go do make, that? Yeah, you go make a ton of money doing other stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> and it was glamorous. You know, we were, you know, it was all the stuff that goes along with what would you would dream up in that lifestyle with, you know, private planes and flying all over the place and all that bullshit. And, you know, but for a 25 year old kid, it was like, again, it was like everything got turned up to a 10, like, you know, and I'm like, you know, oh my goodness. but, but the, you know, the, the other thing that got turned up to a 10 was the stress and the guilt because there was still part of me that knew all this shit wasn't right. Right. You know, because I, you know, morally I had been brought up in an environment that taught me what was right and wrong, mm-hmm. you know? And so, I had to self-medicate more to get into a position to go do what I was doing. And the more of that that I would do, um, you know, the more stuff you pay witness to, you know, right. and the more self-medicating you have to do. And All the right. more stuff you, you know, so it's it, it, that cycle just got bigger and, and stronger until you know, I, uh, go ahead. I was just, you know, what was coming up for me was, um, like, where was God in all this? Like, you grew up in the church, yeah. and you were doing all these things. And I can't but wonder, because, um, you know, when I was about that same age, uh, maybe a little bit younger, you know, I grew up in the church, too. And um, I felt like a, a bad a bad person. And yeah. I had asked God to fix me, and I couldn't be good. So at some point, I decided if I couldn't be good, I was going to be good at being bad. Yeah. So... <laughs> Yeah. And I was. Yeah. And I just wonder, you know, when you're drug smuggling and and doing all this stuff, like, did you ever have those moments? You know, like you could do drugs for a few days, but at the end of those few days, like when you're coming down and stuff, usually you have a conversation with God at some point. Oh, you know, the, the addict's prayer. I had that <laughs> a lot. But, you know, oh, God, I'll never do this again. But I don't know if I was actually talking to him. Yeah, did um, you just edge got out completely during that time? I don't know that I edged him out. I think what, you know, what I, the way I would explain it was when, so my dad was like super Christian mm-hmm. deacon of the church, mm-hmm. right? Right. Everybody liked him. I mean, the guy had like 3,000 people show up to his funeral, Aww. right? So my thing at that point in time was I, I never doubted that God existed. Mm-hmm. That wasn't where I went with it. Um, I just, the conversation I had with him was, well, you and I got some face to face talking to do. So Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to blow this shit up down here until you're ready to talk to me face to face. Wow. And in in hopes that maybe you'll speed that process up a little bit so that we can get on with what we got to get on with. Wow. Which was what? Super arrogant, you know? (laughs) 
but that's how angry and upset I was about my dad. So I was like, you know, you know, if okay. this is the God that, you know, this is where I explained to myself, like, this is the God that, you know, you spent all this time worshiping and all this time doing all these good deeds and all this time trying to do the right thing. And this is what he lets happen to you, you know. What the hell? You know, yeah, what the hell is he? You know, or what or it or whatever, you know. So, yeah, you know, I, I spun all that anger and projected it at something that you can't even really project it at, right? And right. I mean, you can, but it's not like projecting it at a person where you yell at them. And um, that was, you know, that fueled a lot of that sickness too. But again, you know, at the same time, there was, it's like, you know, we're, I was, we're ill equipped to carry any resentment, especially that much. I hear you. you know? And so it, it began to just eat me up and break me. And the only thing that I could do to keep myself going mm-hmm. was to continue to use more and more and more and more and more and more and more. And more. Right. You know, yeah. and, and, uh, didn't you find though that, um, like I, I think sometimes like I had a very, you know, painful period in my life. And if I had not had drugs, I don't know that I would have survived if I had to feel all those feelings. Yeah. I don't, at, at the state, I, well, uh, yeah, at the state I was in, I don't know. You know, I mean, I, 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 I well, I would have done what I ended up doing, which is trying to kill myself. But um, how old were you, you when know, that happened? That was when I was 33, when I hit rock bottom. Oh, I had, okay. um, you know, I, I had the the drug business fell apart. I was I got out without getting indicted, which was a mir- miracle upon itself because we did get caught. Oh, you got caught? But, yeah, we got caught, but money speaks loudly. Um, oh. So. We, you know, we, I was able to walk away from all of it without any problems. You, and so, you bought your way out of that? For the, for the lack of a better way of explaining it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, congratulations. So, well, I don't know if there's congratulations there, but it's just, it was part of the sickness that I was okay. involved with, right? Like there was other people involved. It was a big mess. It I mean, was a it was, big mess. Okay. It, it was. It was. It was. I look back now, I'm like, good God, how did that? And it, went, it, it happened so fast. Past, you know, relatively over, over a couple of years. I was 24, 28, all of a sudden, boom, 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 you know? Right. And in the midst of that, somehow I got married and had a kid. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, and so that was, you know, part of the reason I ended up divorced within a year was like, you know, I, I was an idiot. I mean, I got married, had a girlfriend six months later, you know, and I was cheating on my wife and running around on her and still doing the other stuff. And, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a disaster. It's you know? totally, yeah. <laughs> That's a, there's yeah, a I mean, reason why drugs are illegal. <laughs> that's a whole <laughs> recipe for disaster. Make it crazy. So, you know, then I ended up divorced. And mm-hmm. so then I was separated from my kid, which caused more pain, right? Mm-hmm. I had to self-medicate more. I mean, more angry. Then to be in my early 30s, I was a hot, I was, you know, I was already a hot mess, but I was a major hot mess. And uh, the, only, uh, the only reason that I had not really cracked a, a bottom, I think, was, you know, I always could stay in this delusional state of, who I am, buy, pay, or manipulate my way out of any trouble that I was in, okay. and um, and then get more drugs, you know. And at, at 33, when I moved to Tampa, because my goal was the geographical relocation program was going to, you know, put me out in Tampa, and um, I would be able to leave all my problems in Dallas. Mm-hmm. And I got out here and very quickly um, realized that, that wasn't the case. You know, I I fell into Great stuff. I wanted to be the Jimmy Buffett guy because I was going to just not do anything and hang out on the beach and rent jet skis and whatever it was for my company. And, I, and somehow I ended up being able to do that. But nice. then I drank my way out of it and just it fell apart because all I did was get drunk at the beach every day and crash mopeds. Oh. Um, so you know, it, it was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound very good. So, so what ultimately, uh, what, what made you decide? Because it doesn't sound like you had a whole lot of consequences, and it sounds like you know it was kind of life as usual because you were used to being in trouble. What happened that you decided that yeah. your drinking was and your using was a problem? So I had, you know, when I moved out to Tampa, I, I really wanted to quit. That was the first time I could say like, I really wanted all of it to stop, and it didn't. And I, it, it it scared me because I was like, wait a minute, I can't stop. Like this is. Not I, I, you know, I can remember sitting down even like I was trying anything. I was like, I'll read the Bible again. Like I even tried that at that point in time. Mm-hmm. And I remember staring at it and like the words might as well have been like in another language. I could I was so like coke logged and al- alcohol saturated yeah. that I couldn't even like comprehend stuff even when I was sober, you know. And I was just like I would sit there and go, I don't know what the hell this means. What is, you know, what is this? And so um, I continued to drink. I had moved back in with my ex-wife because we were. She was always the one that would take me back. Um, 
and, and make sure I was at least okay. Hmm. And um, she had let me move in with her. And we went out, got drunk, and got into it. And I uh, knocked her down and hurt her. Mm. And and so I was uh, arrested for um, felony assault. Okay. And so I had to I had to face those charges. And uh, really was strange enough was it was kind of a weak case, but I got the book thrown at me. It was one of those weird moments where like even the attorney I heard goes, "I've never seen anything like this before." And I it was the beginning of the end. Like it was kind of those moments I was like, "What's going on?" Like not only did I get caught, that doesn't happen to me. I got like the the most anybody could get in this situation, which is unheard of at the same time. And so now I had a felony conviction on my record and I was like, what the hell am I going to do now? I can't even get a job. Oh, wow. You got a felony. Yeah. And okay. so did you have to go to jail or anything? I had gone to jail, got bailed out and then, you know, got the felony, got the conviction and I was put on probation. It was one oh, of those. Okay. It was, it was a, a it was a five sp uh, suspended yeah, oh. felony conviction, five year suspended sentence. If I violated, I was going to prison. Oh my God. Yeah, and so um, at that point in time, I'd started. You know, obviously, I wasn't with my ex wife because we had had that run in, and I I had been dating a girl. Right about the time all that went down, and kind of through all this, strangely enough, she didn't run away from me with all this going on. Um, you have the best <laughs> luck with women, I tell you. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> you know. One, <laughs> I don't know if it's good luck. I, 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 well, I shouldn't say that. I have I have had a lot of wonderful women in my life who, uh, amazingly enough, put up with me for a long period of time, mm -hmm. and I I can't explain, including my mom. <laughs> I can't including explain why. Mom. I've been surrounded by phenomenal women my entire life, yeah. um, and I've shit on all of them, you know, at one point in time. Yeah. But um, yeah, that went down. I was on probation, and then what ended up happening was I, I uh, broke up with the girls dating, had nowhere to live, no money, no job, had my car. So I was like, this is it. I'm done. And so I, you know, guzzled a big bottle of vodka and took a whole bunch of depression pills and oh, wow. sleeping pills and got behind the wheel of my car and um, ended up rear ending a lady. Luckily, it was at a stoplight. Like I hit her going like, you know, less than a mile an hour as a fender bender. Oh, thank uh -huh. God. So nobody got hurt. Okay. Uh, but then I got arrested for D, uh, DUI or under the influence driving, mm -hmm. which violated the probation. Oh, so, shoot. Yeah. So now I was looking at going to prison for five years. And so um, when I got into jail, I, uh, the first day I was there, I, I was in a holding tank and it was hot because it was summertime. So they put some fans in there, you know, to try to cool the room off. Mm -hmm. And um, I unplugged one of the bunk with the, uh, the uh, plugs, the metal part, the plug. Oh, wow. And uh, luckily, they got to me before I did too much damage. You know, I'd already tried to kill myself with the pills and somehow didn't die. And right. then I turned around and tried to do that again. And then, so they, they locked me in solitary for a while until I kind of came to. And um, that was, you know, that event was my rock bottom. Like, you know, hey, man, the finances are gone. The delusions are gone. The illusions are gone. The girls are gone. Your friends are all gone. Your money, everything's gone. Everything was gone, mm -hmm. you know. And I was really looking at going to prison for the next five or so years. It was really the, the, my, that was my best option at that point in time. Wow. <laughs> that is so scary. So, yeah, it was terrifying for, you know, middle-class white boy waking up and, and that. Yeah. So, you know, that was where I had a choice. And, um, you know, I, I remember waking up and just sitting there going, this is it. Like, you know, and there was a guy that was in my first cell that I was in. The guy's name was Paul. I'll never forget that. And um, I, I was talking to him, and I wanted so badly for somebody just to say, hey, man, everything's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. You'll get out of this or whatever. You know, so I was, like, telling my story, and the guy just stopped me and said, hey, man, shut up. <laughs> oh my he God. said, um, let me tell you something. And I said, all right. He said, I don't know what's going to happen to you, but I can tell you one thing. If you don't get right with God, this is just the beginning of your pain. And I was like. Wow. It, for what for the first time I heard somebody you know right say something to me mm -hmm. and it registered you know and I was like okay you know I got it so why do you, I, uh, why do you I think up, why do you think in that moment you finally heard heard him I, I think because so much had crashed down you know and I I did I wasn't able to 
there was no all there was all those delusions of personas were gone in that moment just mm. at that moment mm. and i had like to, I, I would say like total awareness total awareness <laughs> you know of like reality yeah of like reality and everything i was yeah. just aware of, you know and so yeah. it had been so long since i'd been aware of anything in reality that i think it spoke deeply to me right and um you know so it clicked and so I, I think that's what happens when, when when people hit these like proverbial bottoms or whatever it is. Like it rattles your cage enough to give you a moment to where like you can hear like there's some awareness there, right? Right. And it's like boom, you can hear stuff. It gets through all the all the filters are shut down for a second, you know. Right. And um and so I was able to hear that and it clicked, you know. So I uh, I spent about a little over ninety days in jail waiting on all this to find out like what was going to go with my prison sentence. And so I, I determined at that point in time, I was like, you know, I'm going to spend my time while I'm here really getting, my, you know, I, I really, what I was thinking was like, I, if I'm going to go to jail, I can't go to jail. Like or go to prison. I can't go to prison like this. Like I, I, I'm not, I can't spend the rest of the next five years in this mental condition. So I've got to get myself right with God and get myself in a position to do whatever. You know, I, I didn't mm-hmm. even know what that was at that point in time. I was just like, like they say, sick and tired of being sick and tired. Sure. And so, you know, I started, once they put me in a cell, they were like, hey, you know, anybody want to go to AA meetings? I was like, screw it. I'll go. I've been before, you know, and I was like, I want to go, you know. Oh, you because have been I just, before? I had been, well, because it was court mandated. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I would, you know, in all my run-ins with DUIs and stuff, I would go, I would show up and have somebody sign a piece of paper. I'd sit in the back or, yeah, you know. know or sit through 20 minutes of it and leave or whatever it was. Like I never really went, you know, I knew what it was. Yeah. How many, um, how many DUIs did you have total? Three. Okay. Yeah. I had three. I had one when I was 18, one when I was in my twenties. And then one was a 30 couple. The first two got dismissed because I was able to wiggle my way out or my dad helped me wiggle my way out of the first one. But yeah, that was, you know, the numerous other run-ins that just weren't recorded. (laughs) (laughs) Right. You know, so, so so you had, had some exposure to AA and um, yep. but you just you weren't ready so it wasn't until um, you were in jail and they invited you to go and you were like what the hell I'll just go yeah I knew like you know I'd gotten some books when I got in and you know one thing I was like I got I got a bible mm-hmm. and, and I got and, and it was recommended that I get a you know 12-step books so I was like okay cool you know a book book so I got that started trying to read you know, I was, I, I was still, it took me a while to be able to start reading, but I went to a couple of meetings and, and, and listened, you know, and some stuff clicked, you know, like I just like, I related to some of the stories. I was like, I remember hearing some of the stories and going, I felt like I was like, Hey, somebody else was like me. Right. You know, Cause I thought I was unique, uniquely broken. You know, like there's right. nobody would ever understand how fucked up I am. Excuse my language, but there's nobody, anybody could ever relate to that. Right. right. Terminal uniqueness. <laughs> Yeah, and then all of a sudden I hear a story, and I'm like, oh, my God, it's like they're inside my brain. Right, yeah. You know, and I, I remember sitting there going, this is crazy. Like, that guy's life's just like mine. How did they know that? Right, <laughs> right. And so that it intrigued me because for the first time, I felt like, hey, there's somebody out there that can understand me, you know? Yeah. And, you know, for that little kid that always felt on the outside, like, nobody gets me and nobody likes me. For the, for first. the first time, I'm like, somebody's felt the same way I felt. Mm-hmm. And so then, you know, then I'm like digging in, I'm really reading in the book and I'm also reading in the Bible and I'm like, hey, first off, this book's great. And the other book, the Bible is like nothing like I remember it. You know, like <laughs> Isn't that funny? All this stuff where like everybody hates each other and you're evil and you're bad and all that stuff. I was like, that's not in here. Yeah. You know, so I kept reading and reading and, and I, did a, I did an enormous amount of journaling and writing and mm-hmm. self-evaluation and, and started working the steps kind of the best as I could in that environment, you know, like with no guidance. So right. I don't count that as my step work, but mm-hmm. I, I did some stuff, you know, right. which helped, you mm-hmm. know, it still helped even, even at that. So um, I did that and, you know, a lot of crazy stuff happened in jail that were, I call miracles, just like little stuff. Like when I needed a book, it showed up, you know, it was like right on time. And when I needed a word from somebody, it was right there, you know, and I ended up, you know, going to the court hearing for me to go to prison and, and my uh my ex-wife was pretty pissed you know she she was showed up to testify because she was a victim in the case that she wanted me to go to prison oh, and man. um so at, at that my attorney goes hey man there's, there's really there's really no opportunity here for you to not go <laughs> <laughs> he's like basically she's gonna lay you in the grease and, and we're done like you know hopefully yeah. you don't get the full five but you're gonna go off the road wow. and so i was like okay if that's what has to happen you know i was 
fully willing to finally accept responsibility to for uh-huh. the things I'd done, I was okay with that because I was like, I did all this stuff, man. So if that's what happens, it's what happens. This is the result of my behavior. And, um, which was also a first, you know, like for me to walk into a DUI court prior to this one and say, Hey judge. And the judge say, did you do it? And I said, yeah, I did it. It's my fault. Like that had never happened. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, and I, then that felt so good. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd never, I had never fessed up to anything un- unless it was a last resort. And then I still would just kind of not fess up to it and do only fess up to the part that you knew about. Um, so to like really come clean with somebody was, you know, amazing. And so by the time I got to the second quarter, I was like, whatever, whatever happens, happens, you know, and I was really in a good spot with my faith. And mm-hmm. strangely enough, my ex-wife walked up to the, to the podium to say something and she had a little speech prepared and then she stopped and just said, don't send him up the road. Please get him help. He just needs to get help. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, afterwards she told me, she was like, I could not, she was like, I had a speech prepared to say, you know, this. And she was like, I just couldn't say it. I could oh, not yes. say it. She was like, the words wouldn't come out of my mouth. And I was like, I was like, that was just somebody intervening for me. Yeah. You know, yeah. at that point in time. So oh, that's I got a, yeah, I got, I got a, I got a shot, you know, and that's, and that's why I took it. I was like, man, I, I got an opportunity here, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, I, I don't know exactly how this is going to go, but I, I, I need to respect the fact that I've been given a big gift, you know, of not having to spend five years in that hell. Yeah, and I'm um, signed so up getting dismissed to a, a court ordered court ordered treatment center mm-hmm. for a six month program, which was great. You know, I was like at the time it scared the hell out of me because I was like, what am I going to do for six months? I'm locked up for six more months. But it um, it enabled me to get very very involved with um, Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, immediately. You mm-hmm. know, and spend an enormous amount of time in groups and in meetings for the first six months. So, mm-hmm. you know, some people say ninety and ninety. I did, you know however many with multiple meetings a day for six months <laughs> six months yeah so, um yeah no that's that's amazing um were people with different people coming in and out all the time of the center of the yeah. treatment center mm-hmm. yeah oh yeah it was a rotating door you know yeah. it, it was because the place was court ordered there probably wasn't as much coming and going as there would have been in another like self-pay because mm-hmm. you know we had to be there if we got out and there was a warrant issued for your arrest so some oh. of you guys tough it out and stay right uh, so I will say there probably wasn't a lot of recovery in there. Um, uh, the, you know, the guys that wanted it got it, and the guys who didn't didn't. It's just like it is in the rooms. You yeah, know? absolutely. And um, so, you know, my thing was I'm going to go at, about this, and for the first time in my life, I'm going to actually try. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's something like this, and put some effort into it, right? And do the work, and and actually do the work, and so. Um, you know, I did everything they told me to do. Stayed there six months and never got in trouble. Wow. Which was also a first time for me. Yeah, I got, I got, uh, I, I, I never got in trouble the whole time I was there for six months, and I ended up being like the house president or what they call the thing. Which, you know, it was, uh, like I said, I never allowed any of that to take place. I never allowed myself to be in a in a position of leadership in a good way, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah, and so I yeah. tried that. Yeah, and I was like, all right, man, I can, I can get behind this. You know, this can be done. You know, and I, while I was there, that's when I got the job at the. Uh, one of the companies I was with for the last 10 years, mm-hmm. um, I started working part-time for them when I was in there. And uh, oh, wow. you know, they gave me a shot, so I was very loyal to them because, you know, at that point in time, I really thought with my background, I was like, hey, the best thing I can hope for is probably like, hey, you know, Eric, go dig a hole over there. And at the end of the day, we're going to ask you to fill it back up. And tomorrow you can come back and dig that hole out again. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I kind of figured that's what my job would be. And uh, this was a, you know, business job. We got to wear dress clothes and go in and make good money. Oh, very good. And uh, I, I had to bust my ass, but it was still, you know, and I was able to work my way up with those guys. And, you know, it challenged me. And it was the perfect environment for me for the years I was there because it challenged me in every area that I needed to be challenged in on a regular and continuous basis. So it forced me to re- continue in my recovery or completely follow my face. Right, you know? right. Did you, you got a sponsor and started sponsoring other people? Did you go that whole route? Yeah, I did. I did. I, uh, you know, my first NA sponsor, I went and went with NA instead of AA uh-huh. when I got out of the treatment. Um, I loved AA, but just in the, over here in, uh, in Tampa, there's a really, both the groups are great, but the NA group I just attached to more so myself. Mm-hmm. And there was a guy that came into the center. He was, he would do his, uh, some of his service work was to come in and do meetings. Mm-hmm. And I remember early on, I was like, I, I didn't know what I wanted to sponsor. I knew I needed to get one. 
And I, he came in and he was always talking about, he talked about recovery in the, in the steps and all that kind of stuff. But he would also just talk about like, Hey, I went to Disneyland this weekend with my girlfriend and, or I went to fishing with some friends and I was like, all right, this guy's having fun too. Like he's, <laughs> his life is, it's not, you know, he doesn't go to meetings 900 times a day and have no lot, no fun, no job, no, no, you know what I'm saying? Right. And so like, for me, I was like, he represented something that was very important to me at that point in time, which was, he was extremely well versed in the steps, which I needed, and he could take me through those. And he also had a life that he was enjoying. And for me, that was important because I was like, I wanted to be able to emulate that. That was the end result for me. It was like, I want to be able to do these steps, but I also want to have enjoyment in life as I'm as I'm doing those at every step of the way. Absolutely. And um, yeah. yeah. So he was uh, sponsor Steve, but sponsor Steve was uh, he taught me that. He taught me a lot of good stuff, man. Mm-hmm. He taught me a lot of great stuff early on. Yeah, I remember. I remember thinking when I first got sober that I was never going to have any fun uh, ever again. Yeah, but, well, that's what you tell yourself, right? Like, how am I going to have fun? Everything yeah, I knew yeah. fun is gone. Uh, yeah, everything I did revolved around drinking and using. So yeah, and, then, and if we look back, we're like that wasn't even fun. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <was pain. laughs> I know. Isn't that something? We called pain fun. <laughs> that is so true. And then it sounded like so in our conversation before we started, it sounded like your recovery journey sort of moved away from traditional 12 step programs to other things. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's constantly evolved over the years. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a good amount of time in the NA environment, got a home group. And that was in 2006. This was in 2007. This would have been 2007. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So by the time I got out of the center, it was 2007. Okay. And, um, and so I was, uh, I had my home group and, um, when I started doing that home group and I had, I had moved, I had to find a new sponsor because Steve could not drive and I didn't have a license at the time. So he and I getting together was very difficult. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, he had told me, he's like, you know, if, if this happens, we're going to, you're going to find another sponsor. And we agreed, you know, and it was, so that was like early in my recovery. It had only been about, you know, about a year. I was like, oh, I got to find another sponsor already, you know? And um, strangely enough, I'm at work and this guy I meet is like four years clean. And he and I hit it off. And so uh, we were able to, I was able to like literally work with my sponsor uh, all day at the job. And then we go to meetings together. So I had a, a lot of attention, you know. Right. That's very <laughs> convenient. So I was, yeah. Yeah. It was really cool how it all fell into place. And, and uh, he and I are still friends to this day. He was at my wedding and Aww. all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, we lived with each other for a while. Wow. And, um, and so as we were doing that, he and I were going to home group. We uh, both, you know, I had stayed very much... Uh, in touch with uh, the Christian side of my recovery. Mm-hmm. And so I had a friend invite me to a, another 12 step group called Celebrate Recovery, which is just a Christian based 12 step program. Okay. And so I went in and, and um, to check it out. It, it, was, it, it scared the hell out of me at first because it was a little hokey because I had the church stuff going with it. Okay. And so I went in the first time and I was like, whoa, this is not like AA or NA. <laughs> and it wasn't like church. Uh, it, for, it, and it wasn't like church because it was like I reckon the people. But then it, you know I I did what my what Steve had taught me to do. Steve taught me something really important early on. It was like, hey man, when you go into meetings, I need you to think of something. I want you to concentrate on finding things that you have in common with people. Mm-hmm. Do not sit and judge and find all the things that you have in different with people because you'll find yourself running out of all those rooms and never going back. Right. And so. I just kept hearing his voice that day when I went, and it was like, just find the commonalities. There's commonalities here. You guys have some stuff. So I did, in between the religious part and in between the recovery part. I was like, okay, I can do this. And I, um, strangely enough, the end of the service, this guy walks on stage, and he's like, he's like, you know, he comes in, he's all GQ'd out, like hair's all decked out, wearing the polo. I mean, this guy's put together, right? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, who's this, you know, who's this guy? That's the first time I think, like, this guy must be the ringleader. You know, he's coming in for the big close, the big sale. <laughs> the big sale. And, uh, yeah, and he, you know, he strolls up, and he gives this big left hook speech at the end, and everybody cries and claps, and they close the thing down, and we go to group. And then they do theirs where there's, like, a, a big group, and then you go to, like, a smaller group to have share groups. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we go to share group, and then M walks his dude in the middle of the share group. I'm like, the group's already started. So I'm like, well, who is this guy? Like, he comes in, strolls in, and just looks at everybody. <laughs> like he owns so the place. Work. Yeah, like he owns the place. Says three words, gets up and leaves. Well, as we're leaving, I figure out, like this guy's like the 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 recovery pastor at the thing. Like so, he's kind of in charge of all of it, right? Uh-huh. And um, so I'm like, all right, I wasn't gonna go back. 
I was like, this, I, this guy, like this guy irked me. Like, <laughs> I don't like it. And then this thing's weird. And, but I, I, I was like talking to my sponsor, Clay, who was with me. And I was like, you know, he was like, no, nah, you gotta go back. And you know, when somebody rubs you the wrong way, there's something there to investigate. You need to look at that. Cause it's really about you. It's not about them. Right. And I'm like, all right, man, now I gotta go back and see what it's about. So I went back. And so this guy ends up being Jason, the guy that you're on the podcast. Oh, is that right? <laughs> no way. Yeah. So it's, that's Jason. So, you know, we, we laugh every time because both of us are sizing each other up, you know, <laughs> the first time we meet, you know, who's this Jack and his story is kind of similar. Like I saw Eric, I knew something was up, but we both in the same time, there was like this weird, like connection with he and I, where we knew yeah. like this guy's going to be part of my recovery for a long time. Wow. You know, a long time. Mm-hmm. And so we kept going there. And uh, then Jason helped me. Uh, I was going to a different church. Jason helped me launch celebrate recovery at the church. I was going to, I volunteered to do that sort of. And, um, I got voluntold. <laughs> I was going to say, how do you sort of, <laughs> well, the pastor was a mentor of mine up there too. And, it was, okay. and um, so when I brought it up to him, he was like, I think you should do this. It's right in line with who you are. You know, so we did that. Totally do it. (laughs) That's exact. Well, what it was was I told him I went to celebrate recovery. I think we should start one at the church here because it was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And he started laughing at me, and I'm like, "What's this guy laughing at me? What are you laughing at me for?" And he reaches under his desk and pulls out all the paperwork for celebrate recovery. He goes, "It's been sitting here for three years. I've just been trying (gasps) to find who the right person was to run it." Oh my gosh! Yeah, I was like, like, "All right, congratulations." So I'll do it. Yeah, I was like, "Cool, I just got promoted." (laughs) Just promoted. So, but that was how I got into public speaking. Because I learned how to talk uh, right. on stage, how to teach and be up in front of people. So it was, a, it was a great avenue for that. So, you know, we did that. Jason and I worked very closely over the years between that and really became kind of the go to people uh, in Tampa for that. And there's another guy here that we work very close with named Mark that runs another one that's still re- really big with Celebrate Recovery here that's a great guy. Mm. Um, and just, you know, continued to dive into the recovery community here and working on ourselves and doing this stuff through uh, Celebrate Recovery. And, um, you know, we ended up. Jason and I both went to work for the Salvation Army Men's Rehabilitation Center here in Tampa. Mm -hmm. They hired Jason and then they hired me as a counselor to implement Celebrate Recovery as their curriculum for their recovery program for the Salvation Army. Okay. And so um, we spent, you know, a couple of years doing that uh, and then it morphed into what you saw today, which is we call it the Adonai House, where it's a a men's men's, um, life restoration home that Jason owns and that I I volunteer at and work with him on projects at for, for that part of my recovery. Oh, very so, cool. So that was kind of, yeah, over the years, I ended up I ended up getting actually ordained and becoming a pastor and then um, did the recovery pastor thing for like six years mm-hmm. as, as I was walking through that. So I did that for the church. And then um, it just, uh, as I continued to grow in my recovery and read, my recovery led me into I kind of away from that and into some other stuff, almost another religion, really. I, I almost converted to Judaism at one point in time. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, strangely enough, it was it was really, a, 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 that was a whole other story that I, I don't, we don't have time for. But it was part of my recovery. You know, like I, I just, but the, the reason all that took place was is that early on in AA and in NA, I learned something really powerful to me, and that was like, principles in action equal change, right? Right, right. And, and so I knew that, you know, no matter how hard I sat and begged God to change something for me, it was mm-hmm. never going to do, ha- nothing was ever going to happen unless I took action. Right. And so the reason I, I, I got into the Judaism was just because it was an enormous amount of principles and it was the same God. And I was like, sure. hey man, look at this. Like Christianity's got some principles. This guy's got like 613. Look at all this stuff, <laughs> you know? Being the overachiever like, can, that you are. Yeah, I'm, I'm the overachiever. Yeah, it, it, that was it though. Yeah. It became another addiction for me. Right. And so I um, I had to learn that the hard way with almost ruining my marriage that, um, you know, that the religious thing had become mm. this weird version of my reco- of, of my addiction. Oh, okay. And um, because I got addicted to the attention and addicted to the, uh, the idea of accumulation of knowledge. Mm. Um for self, you know, for self praise or self whatever, oh. you know, and uh, it, it, we, it it strangely gone off there. And so it took that kind of later run in for me to get into the space I am today, you know, so. It's interesting how we do as, you know, if you have an addictive personality, we do everything like 200%, right? There's yeah. 
no gray area. It's, you know, I, I find like, um, you know, I feel like the theme of my recovery is, you know, find the balance and reconnect mm-hmm. because now balance is not something that comes natural to me. And it sounds like, you know, maybe you're having a similar experience where you're just out of balance with seeking, seeking God. Yeah, it was, yeah, it became, it, it, you know, it became, it wasn't even about God, you know, like I said it was oh. about God, but it was really about the accumulation of Eric. Oh, and, yeah. um, you know, it became very self-serving. And, um, and then I became very hard headed and arrogant in that, like I was right, everybody else was wrong and you couldn't tell me anything. So it's a really dangerous place, sure. but you're right. Like, you know, it's, it was, it's always been easier to be on the extreme, right? Like to either right. be all in or all out, you right. know? Yeah. Um, and so what I've been able to discover in the last, you know, I'd say two years, um, since I moved out of the religious part of it, um, mm-hmm. is that. Um, I, I consider a lot of it full circle. You know, mm-hmm. I, I look at a lot of the way I'm with my relationship with God now, very similar to how it was when I was in jail, where I didn't, I didn't know anything, mm-hmm. you know, and I didn't have to have all these definitions to have everything make sense. I just knew that there was a higher power and that was enough, mm-hmm. you know? And so, you know, I, I ventured off in about two years of Jason and I just kind of took a weird curve because we both have been through the same thing. We both got booted from the church for, continuing to move past where they were comfortable with mm-hmm. and went through the pain of that, you know, cause we had dedicated six years each, if not more and blood, sweat and tears into that. And then have that door shut on you. You're like, wait, what, what, what just happened? Right. Right. So then we've got what we call religious recovery. We've got to get over. Mm-hmm. And, um, we had to work through that, you know, because all of that was intertwined with our legitimate recovery. Yeah. And so it was like the unfolding of that. And then once we got done, not done, but once we got the amount of process where the awareness was there, we were able to step out of that. And I was able to step out of that. Boy, I experienced some really great freedom, which has been like the last year has been the best year of my recovery. Bar none. Even oh, getting wow. canned. You know, <laughs> it's been absolutely amazing. You, you had mentioned to me prior to the podcast that you had gotten laid off from your job of 10 years, the one, the only one that you'd had in recovery? So, I, you know, a little over a year or so, a year and a half ago, I, you know, we started, I started meditating some and really taking a step back and just getting in touch with who I am and, and really focusing on that. Mm-hmm. And in that process, and, and there was, a, there was a lot of work in that. It wasn't just like sitting on a pillow and thinking about it. There's a lot of, there's meditation, but there's a lot of self-evaluation, a lot of work. Um, and I was, using everything I've ever been fortunate enough to, to compile in all my 10 years and 11 years of doing this to kind of self-analyze and self-progress. Mm-hmm. And I began for the first time to fall in love with myself. Aww. And, and that was like, it was like, boom, the lights came on. I was like, you know, all these, I've been in recovery 10 years and I still don't love myself. Wow. You know, I, you know, and that was the moment that hit me. I was like, man, I just need, that's what I've got to focus on for the next year. It's just, falling in love with who I am and getting to know who I am uh, and spending time becoming aware of that because that's where all the empowerment comes from. And so as I did that, like I started to change, you know, like I I handled things differently. And as I was sitting and kind of putting out there um, what I'll call vibrationally, you know, out there, some people will say through prayer or whatever, um, what I wanted, you know, what I desired, uh, it was something new. You know, I knew that it was time to progress, to move on from where I was at. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I didn't know how to make that happen. You know, I just, I, I didn't, and I'd learned enough at that point in time to say, well, you don't really necessarily have to make anything happen to allow things to happen. Right. And, um, so it, I stopped resisting so much that I was, had been resisting in my life and started allowing more things to take place. And then I got fired. So, <laughs> <laughs> which was what needed to happen. You know, like it, it was after being there that long, the relationships were so strong. There were so many people that I was, you know, friends with that I wasn't, I don't know that I would have ever been able to walk in and just quit unless somebody asked me to leave or something else came along. And, you know, it's one of those things I believe, like, you're, you know, somebody, I, somebody can't hand me something as when I'm holding on to something else. Exactly. And um, so I, I look at that as God's way of saying, hey, man, I need you to turn around, open your hands up because I got something better for you. Interesting. So you, you didn't get fired as much as you got laid off. Is that right? Yeah, I got, it was a layoff. Yeah, it was a layoff. It was a layoff. Yeah, I, you didn't I do anything wrong. Like I can, or... But it, 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 no, I didn't do anything wrong. And it was, it was a very um, awesome transition. The company was great. The guys that I worked for were great. 
they saw that too. The comment that the, the owner of the company who I've, I've been, you know, known for over a decade and friends with just said, Eric, I, when I look at you now and in years past, I look at you now today and I see you're too big for this. Aww. And he goes, I don't mean that in a negative way. He goes, I just see like there's more for you to do than you can do here. Right. Yeah. And he goes, and I feel like that we're holding you back. And he goes, so I want to put you in a position to go do what you want to do. And so I was like, okay. And he goes, if you want to stay here, you can, you know, we'll work something out or figure something out. He goes, but I want you to take a couple of days and think about it and get back with me. And so it didn't take me to get out of the parking lot because I, I felt it. Yeah. You know, as soon as I got in the car and drove off, I was like, I felt the weight that I, of, of that. The, the, of what was going on mm. completely lifted off to me. I had no idea about where I was going, what I was doing, how it was, you know, it was right for the holidays, what I'm going to do for Christmas, all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, you know, but it was immediate relief, you know, and not like relief, like, oh, screw them, but just like I felt peaceful, light. Yeah, and peaceful. And I was like, it was great. And we had the best holiday season we've ever had. It was just another. It's on. It's like literally daily right now on another level of zen or whatever you want to call it. Like you know, mm-hmm. peace and it's just really a really cool space that uh, I'm in and the guys that I'm working with at the house over at the Adonai House and my partner at, at ALC. Like it's just a lot of fun right now, and I, I think a lot of it is just I'm just allowing myself to have fun. Uh, I sat down at the end of the year and said, "What is life about?" And a life, and and I came up with like. It's really about me enjoying what I'm doing with who I'm doing it with and making sure that I'm just falling in love with everything that's going on. Oh, and that's uh, beautiful. Yeah, it was a really different approach for me. <laughs> totally different. <laughs> Sounds you know, like but it. it was so refreshing. Yeah. And yeah. even when I hear myself say that, I'm like, oh, God, you know, somebody else that knows me, if they, when they hear this, they'll be like, I can't believe that you said that. <laughs> um, like, they, haven't ta- they haven't talked to me in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the same guy? <laughs> Is that the same crazy but, guy um, we knew? Yeah. It was. It's been really neat. Yeah, no, that sounds amazing. Fun run. And it sounds like you've really decided to, you know, dedicate your life to helping others. Yeah, that's, you know, that's my, that's my sweet spot. And the reason I've moved to the life coaching piece is because I've realized over the years that um, there's all this stuff I've learned can really help anybody. Mm-hmm. And uh, it doesn't have to be somebody that's ju- just somebody that's struggling with drugs and alcohol, although I would that's still a big passion of mine, help anybody that's willing to seek help or needs help. Mm-hmm. But it's just, it's, it's morphed into this place where like, I get to have all these great conversations and get in these great spaces with all these amazing people mm-hmm. and be a constructive part of that, you know? And for me, that's what it's about is being able to share my experience, strength and purpose with other people and let them leverage that in their own lives. Right. And really, I think that, you know, with all that you've shared about what, you know, what has happened to you. I, I genuinely believe that that makes you uniquely qualified because you're, you know, sensitive and in tune to those people that need your help in a way that other people are not. And so, yeah, I could see how, and I got to tell you, you know, I've, I've had experiences too, where in the moment where I'm able to have an open heart and really connect with somebody else and, you know, bringing in a higher power, doesn't matter what you call it, but there is magic there. There is healing that happens. And I tell you, there is no better high than that. Yeah. No, there's not. It's just, it's just, you know, we call it the juice. We're like, that's just the juice, man. (laughs) (laughs) I like it. I like it. It's like, you know, you get the goosebumps on your arm. Yeah. And uh, you're, you're, you know, as, as my buddy Jason says, you're riding the quantum wave, man. You are, you are in the zone. In the zone. I love that. Well, listen, um, we're coming up on our time and you've been so gracious and and sharing so much. I wanted to give you an opportunity to let people know how they can get a hold of you or maybe reach out to you on, you know, whatever kind of social media. Do you want to share how people could get a hold of you or find more about how to work with you? Yeah, they can they can find me. My my new site's going up in the next week, so I'll I'll use that. But it's uh, I am Eric Sims dot com. Okay. And uh, so that'll be that's my coaching site uh, for for you know life coaching and professional coaching. Um, like I said, I'm associated with the uh, it's called Awesome Life Club. So it's mm-hmm. awesomelifeclub.com, dot com. Okay. ALC. Um, that's a that's a project I'm working on with my friend Kay Walker. 
And um, and then if you have a chance to really check out some cool stuff, the uh, the uh, Adonai Restoration uh, in Tampa, which is the, the uh, my buddy Jason Vossler's project that I uh, have the privilege to work with him on. We've got something coming out. I can't talk about it right now because we don't have it finished, and I'm not at, at, uh, I'm not able to discuss the name and everything because we're still going through locking down some of that stuff. But he and I have a really neat project that's. Uh, we're really proud of that's coming out soon and I'll get back in touch with you and that comes out to show it to you and, uh, you know, give you the info on that one. But, yeah, that'll be great. We, I can put all these links in the, sh- in the show notes, the ODAT chat website and things like that too. Yeah. You can find me there. If I can find me on Twitter, Eric Sims, I think it's the Eric Sims effect is on Twitter on, uh, Instagram. Uh, it's, it's coach Eric, coach underscore Eric. Good deal. Well, listen, Eric, uh, thank you so much for your yeah, time. Yeah, appreciate you having me. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you sharing your story. You're doing really good work. Yeah. And I really admire and appreciate all the work that you're doing to help others um, to recover. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate you having me on your show. This is an awesome thing you're doing. Thank you. So keep staying tuned in for more more stories. That's right. Yeah. Okay. All right. You have a great night. Thanks so much. <laughs> no problem. All right. Bye-bye.